Well, good morning, brothers and sisters and young people. Good morning. Well, yesterday we examined and looked a little more closely at that section, Philippians 2, verses 6 to 11. And hopefully you can remember that we looked at the section of the servant prophecies of Isaiah that spoke beautifully to that section there in Philippians. How the Lord Jesus Christ made himself a servant. He humbled himself and was obedient to death. And how Paul there in Philippi, under inspiration, he takes this theme, the language, and in so many cases the very verses there found in Isaiah 40 to 66, and he uses them throughout the book, but they are particularly congested, as it were, there in that section, that standalone section, perhaps a hymn that was sung in the Philippian jail that night in Acts chapter 16. But there's a further servant prophecy connection that I want to draw your attention to. It's on the screen here. Have a look in Isaiah 61. We... uh, We decided not to share this one with you yesterday. We want to just use this for today, for the purposes of today. And Isaiah 61, as you look on the screen, you can see that it has a very, very strong theme about the Jubilee. And we want to try and make this connection now between the Jubilee and that which took place in Acts chapter 16 and and this wonderful message that was received by the Philippians. I just want to illustrate this by way of three points here. Have a look then in your Bibles, please. Isaiah 61 verse 1, you can see the, the language here, to proclaim liberty to the captives. Leviticus 12, 25 and verse 10, proclaim liberty throughout all the land. Isaiah 61 and verse 2, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Leviticus 25 verse 10 again, ye shall hallow the 50th year. If you go down to verse 7 of Isaiah 61, you read, therefore in their land shall they possess double, everlasting joy shall be unto them. And Leviticus 25 verse 22, we we read of um, the idea of the double blessing, the double portion. It runs all the way through this particular chapter, the chapter of the Jubilee. Now the name Jubilee is derived from the Hebrew Jobel, which means a, a joyful shout or a clangor of trumpets. And it's that which was heard when the Jubilee was announced to Israel. Now remember, when we're looking at Isaiah 61, it it is certainly a figure of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here, the servant here, the servant of the Lord, would descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. That is the language that Paul is going to write to the Thessalonians, another ecclesia in Macedonia, a recipient of this message, in response of the man from Macedonia that called to help. Philippi. Thessalonica, thereafter Berea. So this is then the trumpet of the Jubilee that Paul talks about to the Thessalonians. He's speaking about a time of liberty and rest and true freedom. But as we look at this chapter, chapter 61, having now established that there are strong connections with Leviticus chapter 25, we also see that there are striking connections with Acts chapter 16. Isaiah 61 and verse 1, the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Acts chapter 16 verse 26, all the doors were opened. Verse 27, the prison doors open. Isaiah 61 verse 2, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Acts 16 verse 31, where the Apostle Paul said to the Philippian jailer, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And then we read in verse 2 again of Isaiah 61, To comfort all that mourn. And you may remember when I, I spoke about when Paul and Silas came out of the jail, and they comforted those that were there in the Lydian house. Verse 40 of Acts chapter 16, And when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them, and they departed. So we've made these connections then with the Jubilee year and now we've made these connections with Acts chapter 16. 
And though, of course, it wasn't a jubilee year when the earthquake shook the prison in Philippi, the very language of Isaiah is suggesting that it is to be interpreted as such. Why is that, brothers and sisters? Well, we need to understand what the jubilee was intended to achieve. There were three aspects of the jubilee. And we want to try and appreciate what the jubilee was designed to accomplish and then the message to the Philippians. So first of all then, the jubilee was aimed to abolish poverty. It prevented the large and permanent accumulations of wealth and it gave unfortunate families an opportunity, didn't it, to begin all over again freeing debtors of their debts. That's what the Jubilee was all about. The second aspect of the Jubilee, it was intended to abolish slavery. That there was not going to be lifelong bondage. That this, this sense of a hopeless doom which knows no relief till death, that was not the case under the law. That this liberality which was given by the Jubilee. Slaves were made free. And during that sabbatical year and the year of Jubilee, it was a year of rest, wasn't it? The people would enjoy a sabbatical year, and we read that it encouraged families to come together, to read the scriptures together, and that was the year that families came together, united as one, and they enjoyed the Feast of Tabernacles. So those three things then were accomplished by the Jubilee. Now this is really interesting, isn't it, because remember, Philippi was a colony it received a very special privilege from Rome. Let's look at those three aspects now and relate them to the Philippians. You can see what Paul now, under inspiration, is really um, encouraging them to do. So first of all then, as a colony, there were no taxes and there was lots of financial aid from Rome. Yet the Philippians were being told here that they were to trust God. God would provide and give them true prosperity. The colony encouraged freedom from slavery. That was the whole notion of the colony. It was a, a city of freedom, yet only God could truly set them free. Can you see that, brothers and sisters? There's a real play on concepts here. One that was a living reality there and then, and the other one which was based upon trust and faith. And the third one, many of those living in a colony were veterans of war but only God could give them true rest. How beautiful that is, that the very message of the Jubilee has a very specific message here for this colony in Philippi. So the earthquake then in Philippi really was a religious earthquake. It was shaking up the world for these brothers and sisters. God's message of salvation had gone forth to this ecclesia and thereafter it would go to the then known world and for this ecclesia here in Macedonia this was a time of jubilee brothers and sisters they had received the trumpet call this was the message of salvation and if they embraced this message they too would receive true freedom But they had to trust it, didn't they? They had to believe it. They had to believe that Paul had been given that responsibility by God to be a light to the Gentiles, that they were the first recipients of that light. It was a matter of trust, wasn't it? They had to believe that this was a living reality in their lives. And though around them they could see the real benefits of being a citizen of Rome, they were being told that they were to discard that dis citizenship and take on the citizenship of heaven. They were to accept Christ. They were to forsake the benefits of colony life, all the trappings of colony life, and they were to enter into a jubilee-like life brothers and sisters. And it was this jubilee-like life that would bring true happiness, true prosperity, true freedom, true rest. That's the message. 
And we as Gentiles in far-off lands also have received this message of God's salvation. And we too have to make a similar decision, brothers and sisters. We too have to forsake the trappings and benefits of American life, Canadian life, Australian life, British life. And we have to embrace a life of a heavenly colony, don't we, brothers and sisters? A jubilee-like life, where we will be sojourners and pilgrims, where we will have a citizenship in heaven, when we are looking for a heavenly country and a city that comes down from above. These are all concepts that we know and understand. But how hard, brothers and sisters, do we find accepting that message, accepting that exhortation from Paul. So we need to ask ourselves some big and searching questions. What kind of prosperity are we chasing? What kind of motivation is in us every day of our lives? What are we really striving for, brothers and sisters? What have we taken hold of and what are we carrying within our hearts and minds every single day? How much of this world's society, its thinking, its goals, its ambitions, its mindset, its culture has taken root within our conscience? They're all questions we need to ask ourselves. Is our desire to be a, a citizen in the coming kingdom of God? Where is our citizenship today? Where do we want our citizenship to be, brothers and sisters? Where do we want to belong? This is a year of anniversaries, isn't it? The month that has just passed in June, that was 50 years since the Six-Day War. If the Lord remains away and we get into November and December, we hit the centenary of the Balfour Declaration. When General Allenby went through the Jaffa Gate and released the Jews from the hand of the Muslims and the Turks, and the drying up of the Euphrates, the sixth vial in Revelation 16. If the Lord remains away and we get to May next year, we get to 70 years since the re-establishment of the State of Israel. Three momentous jubilees. And we've just been talking about the jubilee this morning. 1917, a jubilee period. 1967, the Six Day War. A jubilee period this year, brothers and sisters. Where is our citizenship? Well, what's the point that Paul is making here, brothers and sisters? Well, he is reminding this ecclesia that they are to put their confidence in God and not themselves. And we're going to now consider what I believe is a heartbreaking message from Paul. Because he's going to warn them of Judaizers. He's going to warn them of a group within the ecclesia that believed fundamentally in continuing the practices of the law and the practices of circumcision. And three times now Paul is going to say, look out, look out, look out, brothers and sisters. Let's look at that together, please. Philippians chapter 3. Finally, my brethren, verse 1, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to come. To me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evildoers or evil workers. Beware of the concision. So here Paul is alerting this ecclesia. This ecclesia needs to be watching out. They need to be on their guard. Brothers and sisters, we need to be on our guard too. What is this message all about? Where he says, beware of dogs. And we know that that term was used by the Jews in describing the Gentiles. It was a, 
a use of contempt, wasn't it? But here now, Paul turns that expression round and applies it to these Jews, these Judaizers, and he treats them now in a state of contempt. Now look in your margin, brothers and sisters, by that expression, beware of dogs. And where does he take you to? Well, he takes you all the way back to Isaiah 56, one of the servant prophecies. Again, these connections are being made in the book of Isaiah. And if you look at that section, you will find that Isaiah is talking about Israel's watchmen, those that were given, those that had the vested responsibility of being the elders of the flock, the watchers over the ecclesia, the guardians of the camp. And he says that they had become blind, that they had become ignorant, that they were dumb dogs. That's the term, brothers and sisters, that they were dumb dogs, dogs that cannot bark. They just sleep, they just lie down, and they love to slumber. They, they, they were the Jewish leaders, brothers and sisters, and they were happy enough to go along with the tide of apostasy, and they were not standing up for the truth. They were not accountable, brothers and sisters. They were silent. They were slumbering. They were dumb dogs. And so can you see the point of all of this? It's taking us back to Hezekiah, and we know wonderful things were achieved in the faith of Hezekiah how the Assyrian host was stopped at the door. But what was the root of the problem? The root of the problem were these dumb dogs, these leaders that should have known better. They had become irresponsible, brothers and sisters. They were no longer guarding the camp. They were sleeping, and they loved to sleep, and they were silent, and they didn't bark. There was no warning, no voice of danger. Can you see what Paul is saying here? That just as these dumb dogs, the leaders, could have undermined all the faithful work of Hezekiah, now the leaders here could repeat that. They could undermine all the wonderful work. He that hath begun a good work in you will finish it. Lydia, the jailer, the young damsel, it could all be undermined by these dumb dogs. These Judaizers, brothers and sisters, these brethren that should have known better. Well, what was the problem here? Well, they believed, at the end of verse 2, in the concision. This is the only term, time that this term is used in the New Testament. It means mutilation. It speaks of false circumcision. In other words, there was nothing religious in what they were doing. It was a ritual of men, brothers and sisters. And here there is a real danger when the traditions of men begin to silence God's word. It's a warning for us all, isn't it? And these words are very powerful because here Paul is saying that they had become this group of Judaizers who believed in the traditions of men, that they believed that salvation could be wrought by works, that they were, in effect, a party of mutilation. It's a horrible expression, a party of mutilation. That's what he's referring to them as. And there's a play in the Greek here which does not carry over in the English. Let me just explain here these two Greek verbs. The verb to circumcise is peritoma, and the verb to mutilate is catatome. And scholars tell us that these words are interchangeable. They are highly related, but they speak of two very different things. And they are not to be confused. Because Leviticus 21 verse 12, God tells the children of Israel, he forbids them to self-mutilate. Paul is saying, you Jews, you think you are circumcised. Really? In reality, you are mutilated. Now, brothers and sisters, there's a very important point in all of this because circumcision was ordained by God upon the nation of Israel as a sign, as a sign that they were his people. And, and the story of circumcision begins, doesn't it, in Genesis chapter 17, verses 9 and 10, where, where God lays out this symbol of circumcision and he tells them that that was his eternal sign. It spoke of the covenant relationship between him and them. But even when you go all the way back to the Old Testament, God makes it clear, even in the law, 
that if they were just circumcised by flesh, that was not nearly enough. They had to be spiritually circumcised. Let me just illustrate this to you. It's an interesting thing, really, because we often talk, don't we, about the New Testament being circumcised of heart, and that's something that Paul taught. In fact, it was something that was taught in the law. The idea of circumcision of the flesh was never enough, even under the law, brothers and sisters. Let's not get that wrong. Look at this then. Leviticus chapter 26 and verse 41 we read, of uncircumcised hearts, that they were to be humbled in order to accept the punishment of God. God intended to make their hearts circumcised. In Deuteronomy 10 and verse 16, and then in chapter 30 and verse 6, God spells out that he is looking for the circumcision of the heart so that they would love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. These are concepts that are rooted in the law, brothers and sisters. This wasn't introduced in the New Testament. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 7, the prophet talks about the uncircumcised ear of Israel and that it needed to be circumcised in order to hear God's word. And then relating to when the children of Israel came out of Egypt under Pharaoh, where it is referred to as the uncircumcised lips there in Exodus 6 verse 12. So even under the law, God was looking for something more than ritual. He wanted them to foster a love for him. Though it was seen outwardly in the rituals, it was driven, it was motivated by a love for him. So Paul is therefore saying to the Philippians here, If you merely have just circumcision to show that you are devoted to God, then that's not enough. So, for us as brothers and sisters here, it would be something like, if all you have is baptism, brothers and sisters, to show your devotion to Almighty God, that is not merely enough. It's a very powerful message, isn't it? And it's so true, isn't it? Because under the law, it was designed as a ritual. And we, in our worship, in the very things of this week, in all the various meetings that we have to attend, rushing around, we can make life in the truth a life of ritual, brothers and sisters. Can't we? And by doing that, we become whited sepulchres. It never touches our heart. We can put on all the traditions of the truth and we can look so godly, we can look so spiritual to one another, yet God is so far removed from us. And we know at times in our lives, as we look back and we think for a moment, we know that there are patches in our lives when that has been true. Let it not be today or tomorrow, if the Lord will, brothers and sisters. These are all lessons here found in the law that Paul is reminding these Philippians to remove themselves of the power and the influence of these Judaizers. But there's something else that is really fundamental in all of this because these Judaizers, they took pride in what they did. What should we be taking pride in, brothers and sisters? What should we be boasting in? Well, the only thing we should be boasting in, that the Lord Jesus Christ decided to die for us. That's it. True and simple. That's the only boast that we have, isn't it, brothers and sisters? That the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the one who sits at the right hand of the Father, decided to die 2,000 years ago for you and for me. And surely that's sufficient. Is Is there anything else worth boasting about? That's the point that Paul was addressing these Judaizers. Now, I want to illustrate this to you, brothers and sisters, because there were two ecclesias. I don't know whether you have appreciated this. There are two ecclesias that could have been the same. I've already said the Philippians were this wonderful ecclesia. And I was reminded from Brother Bill yesterday that Thessalonica was also the joy and crown of the Apostle Paul. This eclectic too, but there was something particularly special about the Philippians. But there was so much potential 
with the Galatians. Oh, foolish Galatians. I want to show you this. I want to illustrate this as an example for you and for me. Can you come with me to the book of Galatians here? And, and first of all, I'm going to show you that they shared something in common with the Philippians. Now remember, the Galatian Ecclesia, how was it established? When was it established? Can you remember? Well, it was during the first missionary, wasn't it? It was here that Paul was going to say, I go to the Gentiles. There, when he was in Antioch, when, when he, he recites the history of Israel and how they had, had rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember that phrase, the Jews were stirred up. Remember that? Well, now he writes to the Galatians and he reminds them of his role as a light to the Gentiles. These words found in Isaiah 49. Can we have a look at this then? Galatians chapter 3. And the first missionary journey, if you remember, is found in Acts 13, verses 14. 13 and 14. Well, Galatians chapter 3. And this is the first important connection with the Philippians, and I don't feel that there's a better connection. So Galatians 3, verse 3. O oh, ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit... Are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Now under inspiration, I believe there's real um, stress and emphasis being made on this word begun. It's only used one other time in the New Testament, and it's this key verse in Philippians. Remember that? Philippians 1, verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Christ. That's the very same word, begun. And the idea of beginning in someone and beginning with someone. Well, something had begun in this ecclesia here in Galatia. But we're going to see the difference. The Philippians embraced what God was doing with them. That the Galatians became self-indulged and they became misdirected by the teaching of the Judaizers. So here's two ecclesias, brothers and sisters where God had begun a good work. We've already seen the wonderful example of the Philippians. I'm going to illustrate you now what happened here in Galatia. And it's a warning for you, and it's certainly a warning for me. So if you go back to chapter 1, bearing in mind that God had begun a good work in Galatia. God had begun a good work in Galatia. What had they done with it, brothers and sisters? Galatians 1, verse 6. I marvel, says Paul, that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So reference is being made there at the end of verse 7 to the Judaizers. But what I want you to notice there is the word another, another gospel. And that word literally means different. And it gives the idea from somebody else from somebody else. Paul received the gospel from the Lord Jesus Christ as a personal witness, but they received it from somebody else. Here there was a perversion. The message that this ecclesia now held was dressed up in the language of the truth. And because it was dressed up in the language of the truth, it was dangerous because it wasn't easy to spot. It was deceiving, it was devious, it was fundamentally faithless, brothers and sisters. And at its heart was the teaching of salvation by works, that you could be holy enough, that you could be good enough, that you could be faithful enough in order to obtain eternal life. And when I say those words in the context of this Bible school, it sounds ludicrous, doesn't it? But this is what they believed. This is what they believed. And we can't underestimate this thinking because by having that thought, everything that the Lord Jesus Christ had achieved was being ignored. They, they were embracing the law, but the law spoke of Christ. The law, the sacrifices, the rituals, they all spoke of Christ, didn't they? Yet they embraced the shadow and didn't accept the image, brothers and sisters. What a powerful lesson that is. But there's also a very intriguing takeaway in all of this because by doing that, what were they doing? They were focusing on themselves, weren't they? It was their efforts, their salvation, rather than thinking upon our Lord, their Lord, or 
my Lord that we looked at yesterday. Remember that when Paul says, he's my Lord. And this Judaistic thinking can get into our minds. It can infiltrate into our lives, brothers and sisters, when we feel that by doing good things in the truth, that somehow we are more righteous and more worthy than one another. It's perverse, and I'm going to show you that, brothers and sisters. Let us never think, in all the great things that we get involved in the truth, that we are better than one another. We are not. I'm going to show you this right now. So, let's just pick up then. First of all, Paul is establishing, before he makes a pertinent point, he is establishing, I am the light, and I speak with authority. So there we have it then, Galatians 1 and verse 12. So, so no wonder then the book of Galatians sounds fierce, it's hard-hitting, because it needed to be. And Paul, before he, he is hard-hitting in his language, he reminds them of his authority. So there we read in verse 12, For neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then verse 16, To reveal his Son in me, that I may preach among the Gentiles. That's Isaiah 49 verse 6, isn't it? Immediately I confirmed not with the flesh and blood. So here, establishment. He's established point that he is a light to the Gentiles. The very words that he revealed in Acts 13 verse 46, at this very place in Galatia. And he reminds them now in his letter. Well, I've already alluded to earlier in the week that there are many, many, many connections between Galatians and Isaiah 49. In fact, there are more connections here in Galatians than Philippians because here Paul is really stressing his authority. We'll go through some of these because there's quite a list. So then, Isaiah 49 verse 1, The Lord, Yahweh, hath called me from the womb. Galatians 1 verse 15, you can spot this as you read there, as you're there in Galatians. God who separated me from my mother's womb. Isaiah 49 verse 3, in whom I will be glorified. Galatians 1 verse 24, they glorified God in me. Isaiah 49 verse 4, I have set my strength for naught and in vain. Galatians 2 verse 2, I should run or had run in vain. Isaiah 49 verse 6, I will also give for a light to the Gentiles. Galatians 1 verse 16 that we've just read together, that I may preach him among the Gentiles. But, but this epistle is rich with connections. You can take my slides afterwards. I'm just going to pick the top one of each of the slides. Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken the people from afar. Isaiah 49 verse 1. We, we looked at that, didn't we? It was all about the context of the Gentiles, the light going forth to the Gentile world. Galatians 1 verse 2 and 2 verse 8, you can see that Paul is writing very specifically to the Gentiles. Isaiah 49 verse 3, in whom I will be glorified, Galatians 1 verse 24, and they glorify God in me. Isaiah 49 verse 7, the Redeemer of Israel, Galatians 4 verse 4, 5, to redeem them that were under the law. Here um, in Isaiah 49, can a woman forget her sucking child that she would not have compassion on the son of her womb? And then in Galatians 4 verses 1, and for as long as he is a child, God sent forth his son made of a woman. Isaiah 49 verse 23, they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. Galatians 5 verse 5, for we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. So there are many, many connections there, brothers and sisters. The only point I want to highlight here is that Paul here is, is, is really emphasizing the point that he is the fulfillment of Isaiah 49, that he is the fulfillment of the light to the Gentiles, that the ecclesia of Philippi were the recipients, the first recipients of the light going forth to the Gentiles, that here in Isaiah 49 it pointed forward to Paul, Paul being an example of the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul pointing backwards to the ministrations of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul pointing forward to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in the kingdom of God. Can you see that, brothers and sisters? And, and this ecclesia were to take note of these points here. But tragically, the Galatians had returned back to the law. They, they were not accepting this light, this new gospel 
that had come through this wonderful chosen vessel, a vessel selected by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. They disregarded it. They threw it away. They trod the, ge- the gospel underfoot. Look, look at these words. Come with me now to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 now. And here we see what Paul wanted this ecclesia to do. How were they to solve this problem? Well, verse 11 then of Galatians 5, And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, there was no need to preach circumcision, if I preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offence of the cross ceased. I would they were even cut off which trouble you. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, notice. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. So notice there that we have been called to liberty. Paul says that we have now freedom from the law, that we are no longer under it. But we do something with that freedom, brothers and sisters. Did you notice that? What do we do with that freedom? Well, we find it in verse 13. By love, serve one another. And then he goes on to say, Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. So we've got freedom from the law, but we now place ourselves again under bondage. But this is a different kind of bondage. This is a voluntary bondage. This is not demanded by the daily rituals, brothers and sisters. This is based upon the covenant. And the covenant asks us to do this willingly. It doesn't demand us to do this. This is a a voluntary bondage, brothers and sisters. That's the fundamental difference. We are free from the bondage of the law, but we place ourselves in the bondage of Christ. And in that bondage, by love, serve one another. Can you see? Can you see what Paul's saying? You you can't do anything. You, you, You cannot do anything to achieve your salvation. This list of works that Paul spelt out, remember that in the profit and loss account yesterday? You you, you can't do anything. Well, you can do one thing. You can serve one another in love. Can you see that, brothers and sisters? It's it's really very, very profound, isn't it? You, you, You can't do anything. But I will ask one thing. Serve one another in love. That's all we can do. So you can forget your long list of achievements in this life and even the achievements in the truth. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is the way that that knowledge works in your life and you serve one another in love. As you place yourself under voluntary bondage, it is in the serving, brothers and sisters, in the serving. That's the only thing that we can achieve in our servitude. It's so powerful. It's so profound. Come back to chapter 5 now. And verses 5 and 6 here, we're already in chapter 5, but have a look at verses 5 and 6 now. And we've got this triplet, faith, hope and love. Notice there, with this triplet, for, well verse 5, for we through the Spirit wait for the hope, notice, of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. So notice here, that this, this, this contrast that's being made with the law, and, and Paul says, remember this royal triplet, remember faith, hope, and love. And what he says there, if you look at verses 5 and 6, he's saying, your waiting through faith brings love. I'm going to repeat that. Your, your waiting through faith brings love. This is what our waiting should be. In our waiting, we should be showing love for one another to our brothers and sisters and our family. This is in the recognition of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. Oh, foolish Galatians who are there obsessing over the rituals of the law and the pride of the flesh, as it were. And they'd lost the plot, hadn't they? It was all about serving one another with faith, hope and love. So in other words, then Paul is making the point, I'm waiting, he's saying. I'm waiting because I cannot achieve it myself. I have to wait. 
I've got to wait for the Lord Jesus Christ. There's nothing that I can achieve. I can't bring in the kingdom of God. I'm waiting. And I'm waiting with faith. And I acknowledge that the work has been done. And it's been completely done by Christ. There's no work that I can do. There's nothing that I can do. The work's been done. It's been done by Christ. And I wait. And I wait faithfully. And and while I wait, my service is happy and joyful. And I love my Lord. And this I show in the way that I love my brothers and sisters. And I am deeply appreciated because I know that one day, if I am found faithful, the Lord will justify me to eternal life. That needs to be our mindset, brothers and sisters. And so is your service joyful? Do, Do you take joy in serving one another, brothers and sisters? Is this our attitude in our service. This is what Paul is stressing to the Philippians here. Well, the contrast then between the old and the new way is eloquently summarized in Galatians chapter 2. And I want you to notice how Paul uses the personal pronoun here. And and it's, it's moving, I find it moving anyway, in what he's saying here. Galatians chapter 2 then, and we'll pick up in verse 19. For through the law am dead, through I, for, for though through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness cometh by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So, so there you are, verses 19, 20 and 21. Just, just notice the use of the personal pronoun there, the word I. It, it's littered throughout This little section here, isn't it? The use of the personal pronoun. And there, that's the point that Paul is making. That's the the law, isn't it? That's the Judaistic thinking. I, it's all about me. But it wasn't. Because it's all about Christ. And this is the point that Paul is making. Christ was his focus. Christ was now his life. Is it ours, brothers and sisters? Notice these words in verse 19. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Can you see the the difference there? No longer is it I, but it's me. And, And this word me is repeated for emphasis. In what Christ did, Paul is saying, it was for me. It was for me, he's saying to the Galatians. It's as if Paul is saying... Even me. He, he's staggered by what Jesus has done for him. He's almost embarrassed. Can you see the difference, brothers and sisters? This Judaistic thinking which has I at the centre. And then suddenly this recognition that Jesus died for me. Can you see that? So easily said. It's a lifetime to put into practice, isn't it, brothers and sisters? What a message, that Jesus died even for me. It's an astonishing message, isn't it? Even for you and I. And this is the point, we we cannot obtain, we, we cannot secure our salvation. It's been done in Christ. And all we can do in deep thankfulness and appreciation is wait and wait and wait and serve one another in love. Can you see that, brothers and sisters? This is the whole theme of Philippians. Can you remember that? All, the idea of all, coming together. And that word sin, S-Y-N, with, coming together, united as one body in Christ. We can't do anything by ourselves. But all we can do is serve one another. And if we ever have the attitude where we become puffed up in our own works, what are we doing? Well, we've seen it in Galatians, and we might not want to accept this, but it's true. We marginalize the power of Christ. If you ever feel that you can attain to righteousness, you marginalize Christ. The work has been done. Of course, it is imputed unto you, but the work has been done, and it is a token of grace. And if we had that attitude every single day of our lives, how many ecclesial problems would be solved, brothers and sisters, when it's not about I, 
but it's about Jesus Christ died for me and you. Can you see that? It's very powerful. But let's bring it back to the Philippians now because we've seen that this was a community, it was a colony. And I believe that Paul is stressing here through the epistle to the Galatians and what we've seen in the Philippians that this colony was not to be made up of individuals, it's a colony of community, brothers and sisters. A colony of community where each of us appreciate the work that the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us and for one another. And we serve one another in unison and in harmony and in acceptance of the work that the Lord Jesus Christ is performing in the other person's life. It is a community. This is what true citizenship is about, brothers and sisters. Loving thy neighbours as thyself. This was the message of the Jubilee, wasn't it? Wasn't it? This is where we began, Leviticus chapter 25. This is the message of Galatians. It's the message of the Jubilee. And the Philippians had received this message of jubilee, that they were now free. But they make themselves bond slaves to Christ. Remember how Paul opens his epistle? As a bond slave, as a voluntary bond slave. As we've already said, would have sounded monstrous to this colony. But now all these threads come together in this beautiful tapestry. But what a wonderful, joyful message of of. of of gladsomeness this is all about, isn't it? The, the, the joyful clangor of the trumpets. Well, what is the joyful clangor of the trumpets here? Our Lord has risen, and he's on his way to establish the kingdom of God, and he brings salvation with him for you and for I. That's the message of the Jubilee. That's certainly a message worth sharing, isn't it, brothers and sisters? Well, come back to Philippians, please. Having thought about this wonderful message of salvation, that it comes through grace, look what Paul says here, which you may be a little confused about. Which is the theme of today, where we read there in Philippians 2 and verse 12, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling at the end of verse 12. So is that contradicting everything that we've said so far? Well, what I'd like you to notice is the beginning of that verse there. It's the word wherefore. It's connecting thoughts back to the previous verses. And the previous verses are all about the Lord Jesus Christ and his example. You've got that section, verses 6 to 11. Wherefore? Wherefore? But this has caused a problem, work out your own salvation. We've already said that we cannot earn salvation. That was the message to the Galatians. So what do we mean by fear and trembling? We're not going to turn up these passages in the interest of time, but there are three passages that we have in the New Testament that speak of fear and trembling. It's the only time that these two Greek words come together. So first of all then, you can go to 1 Corinthians 2 verse 3, and here Paul says that he didn't exert his authority. He didn't influence, dominate the ecclesia there in Corinth. So he chooses to work with his hands. He, he provides for himself. He's filled with anxiety to do the right thing. He knows that he can abuse his situation, but he's filled with anxiety to do the right thing. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 15, we've already mentioned earlier on in the week that the Corinth Ecclesia were a little lax in paying for the Jewish fund. And now Titus is going a second time. And the Ecclesia here in Corinth is, is really anxious about not letting down Paul. They are fearful and anxious. They're going to give this time. And then in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 5, it's all about servants. And, and the responsibility is that masters, masters have a responsibility here, and servants are to serve their masters. And now this is difficult, isn't it? Because some of you have shared the difficulties that you're encountering in everyday life. But Ephesians 6 verse 5 tells us that we as servants, servants to our employers, we have to serve our employer, however unreasonable that person is at times, with fear and trembling. And, and when you draw all these ideas together, it literally means to be 
filled with anxiety to do the right thing. That's what it means. It's not the idea of being fearful, being scared. It's acknowledging how God has worked in your life, that you have received his blessings, and the blessings are so great, you're just anxious to do the right thing. And, and for me, it's characterized by Joseph. Can you remember when Joseph was tempted by Potiphar's wife, and he says, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Can you see that? What, what, a, what an amazing statement that is. But this is fear and trembling. He's acknowledging that God has worked in his life, and how could he do such a thing? He's anxious to do the right thing for God. So though we cannot do anything, brothers and sisters, and we cannot do anything to earn our salvation, nevertheless, we're instilled with an anxiety to do the right thing. We know that God sees everything. We know that God is directing our course. We know that there's a crown of life waiting for us if we walk forward, striding forward in faith, and we're just anxious. We're anxious to do the right thing. Well. I'm going to finish here. I had a bit more to go, but I'm not going to do it. Um, but I do want to show you this, right? We're going to finish with Hezekiah. And maybe we'll pick up some of these ideas tomorrow because they are important. We'll see. But let's finish off, please, in 2 Kings chapter 17. Maybe today I can finish nearly on time. 2 Kings chapter 17. And, and we've already said that there are lovely connections between Philippians and Hezekiah. So I'm going to finish there with a connection with Hezekiah. And you might have to do this exercise on your own. Where does this idea of fear and trembling come from? Well, we've seen that it works, four, it works out four times in the New Testament. But I suggest that it's based on the life of Hezekiah. And that's no surprise, is it? Uh, because it's loaded with connections with the servant prophecies. Now, when we come to 2 Kings chapter 17, it's the chapter that, that precedes Hezekiah becoming king. And we're not going to go through it, but you can see it on the screen. There's a play on the word fear all the way through 2 Kings chapter 17. Can you see that? It's found in verse, just, just follow it in your Bible please, you'll be able to spot out this word, and it's the same Hebrew word. It's found in verse 7, verse 25, 28, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, and 41. Okay? Fear. Fear. When you come to the next chapter, chapter 18, it changes, the tone changes, and this is the chapter of Hezekiah. Right? So you're, 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 you've got this fear that's being um, rammed home. It's a fearful thing, it's a fearful thing, it's a fearful thing. And now it's the reign of Hezekiah. What is he going to do? Well, you see there in verse 3 that he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And then, notice there in verse 5, he trusted in the Lord. Now that word trusted, now there's a run on the word, okay? So in the, in the chapter, chapter 17, there's a run on fear, and now we've got another couplet, fear and trembling, fear and trembling in Philippians, and now it's fear and trust. You find it in verse 5 of chapter 18, verse 19, verse 20, verse 21, twice even, 22, 24, 30, and then chapter 19 and verse 10. And it literally means to have confidence. And that's where we're going to finish, brothers and sisters. We're going to finish there. The fear and trembling. We've misinterpreted that, I believe, in our community at times. It's got nothing to do with doing something ourselves and we do it in a state of fear. No. We do it with an appreciation of what has God has done for us and we go out of our way to do the right thing. We go out of our way to do the right thing. Now here, what governed the life of Hezekiah? That word fear has a double meaning. It can mean to be frightened and it also can mean to revere. To revere. Acknowledging that God sees and is there with you in every day of your life, in every moment, in every situation, we revere him. And it's the trust, brothers and sisters. Hezekiah trusted in his God. He trusted. He knew that God was working in his life, and he trusted. And because he trusted, and because he revered his God, he went out of his way to do the right thing. Remember that series of words, he, that, he began and he ended. Remember that? He began and he ended. He was full of good works, wasn't he? He was full of good works. And I'm not telling you, don't please go out of this room and say, 
Brother Stephen told us not to do anything in the truth. I'm not telling you that at all, right? Hezekiah was full of good works. But it was motivated by a fear and a trust. And I believe that's the message to the Philippians, brothers and sisters. Trust God. Have your full confidence in this one. Because he who's begun a good work in you, he's going to finish it. So trust him. Trust him with your life. Thank you.